Turns out I was massively wrong about the Apple event today. Hello and welcome back to Marketless Reviews and thank you for subscribing if you have. If you haven't subscribed, the button is just down there. <sighs> so I've just watched the entire Apple event today, which is Tuesday the 14th of September, and I got it completely wrong. I, I mentioned earlier this week that I was not looking forward to it at all. Wasn't bothered about the iPhone 13, thought they'd only show us the iPhone and the Apple Watch. Turns out that wasn't the case at all. It was actually a really, really exciting, interesting, and fairly eye-opening event. Now, I have literally just watched it, so what you're about to see is my initial reactions. I need time, as always, to kind of get things in my head right and just try and work out what all this means from a product perspective, what it means from your perspective if you're looking to buy any of these devices. So the first device they revealed was, and you might not have thought this was very exciting, I think it's quite impressive. It's the successor to this, which is the eighth generation iPad. So this will be the, the ninth generation iPad. And this is the cheapest iPad you can get. And as it turns out today, we were told that it's the most popular iPad as well, apparently. And I'm not surprised at all because it's so well priced. And it's particularly well priced for education, for people that don't want an iPad Pro or even the iPad Air. They just want something, they want an iPad basically, but they don't want to spend a huge amount of money. They want to spend the least amount of money possible on a new iPad. For that, you get a really good device. And okay, it's got Touch ID here and it's got bigger bezels and stuff like that, but it's still a thin tablet. It still has the latest processor in it. It's a great device. And it's also compatible with things like the Apple Pencil. Now the new one, I have to look at my notes, sorry. Um, it's same design, A13 Bionic, so brand new chip, much, much faster. And according to Apple, it's three times faster than the best-selling Chromebook. And that's what they're going for really, because along with the Apple Pencil support, you can also connect this to one of Apple's smart keyboard folio, so it, be it becomes a little laptop, basically. The other thing they're doing is giving you a much better front-facing camera. This one is a 12 megapixel front-facing camera with a thing called Center Stage. And Center Stage is this pretty awesome feature that's coming with iPad OS 15, which tracks the camera movements based on who's in the frame. If you move around, it kind of moves along with you. It widens when someone else comes into view. It's all about FaceTime, remote learning, remote calling with your friends and family and stuff. And yeah, to get that on the base level cheapest iPad is, is a good move, I think. It also gets True Tone, which is the screen technology that changes the white balance based on the ambient room light and just makes it look always properly white. And they've doubled the base storage to 64 gig, which is fantastic news. Honestly, if you want a cheap iPad, or it's for education or for your school. The fact they've upgraded this so significantly is, is a pretty big deal. Right, the next announcement completely took me by surprise. I was not expecting this at all. I mentioned recently that the only iPad mini I have access to is this one, which I think is the second generation. So it's a very old iPad mini. I've not turned it on for years, but even just picking it up now, it's such a lovely size. And for ages now, I've wanted them to redesign it and get rid of the big bezels and get rid of the touch ID on the front. And there's been rumors about it on and off throughout the years. and nothing has arrived until today. And as I say, this was the biggest surprise for me. So the iPad mini is getting a complete redesign. So it looks a little bit more like the iPad Air 4 and the iPad Pro. There's new colors with it as well, as you would expect. They're quite muted. I'm not that keen on these new Apple colors that they're, they're using there. Like I said, they're a little bit muted, not particularly inspiring, but, but some of the headline features for this new iPad mini are superb. So for example, the screen has a liquid retina display, 500 nits of brightness, true tone, wide color, and touch ID is now on the power button, just like the iPad Air. The cameras have been upgraded as well, so they have a 12 megapixel front, and I think, tw yep, 12 megapixel rear as well, center stage again on the front camera, and it's also got USB-C, which is the best news ever. Perhaps most important of all, though, is the fact that it supports the Apple Pencil 2. Now, the Apple Pencil 1 is dreadful. It's too long, it rolls off every single surface. You have to charge it by plugging it into the iPad lightning port. It's just a stupid design. Whereas the second generation is superb. It's magnetic, sticks to the side of the iPad. It's smaller. It's got this ridge so it doesn't roll off every surface. And part of the reason I've been wanting Apple to redesign this is because I wanted it to have that Apple Pencil 2 support. The idea of having a little tablet like this that you can attach your Apple Pencil to and carry around like a kind of digital notebook 
is really exciting. So I could not be more excited about that new iPad mini. The only problem, I think, is the price. And it starts at $499. That's a lot of money. When you add the Apple Pencil 2, and then perhaps you add a folio case, etc., it starts to get a bit expensive. I was just a little bit surprised by the price. I, I thought if they'd kind of pitched it max $400, 400 pounds, it would sell like hotcakes. It may still sell like hotcakes, who knows? I just think the price is a bit much. I'd love to know what you think about this. Let me know in the comments. Are you gonna buy the iPad mini? Right, next up was the watch. This is an Apple Watch Series 6. It's fantastic, although I have recently kind of switched between this and the Casio G-Shock that I have. I'm not that attached to the watch anymore, but it still performs a fairly important role in my life and in my business. Now the Series 7 is, well, at first glance, it looks identical to the Apple Watch Series 6, but they have redesigned it slightly. It's got a slightly larger display, about 20% bigger apparently, although 50% bigger over the Series 3. So if you're coming from an older Apple Watch, it's gonna be a massive upgrade in terms of screen size. And what was interesting, on the kind of intro video for this Series 7 Apple Watch, a guy was on his bike and fell off and brushed it across the floor and all this dust and stuff hit it and rocks and things. And I thought immediately, ooh, this, this is interesting. Because what I'd love is a really rugged Apple Watch, a kind of G-Shock version of the Apple Watch. That isn't what this is. It's just a tougher version. Now, how tough it is, well, I guess we will find out from certain YouTubers who will put it into blenders and things. I won't be doing that. But it apparently, according to Apple, it's much tougher. And they said all sorts of fancy things as they always do about the design. For example, the soft rounded corners that offer seamless integration between the screen and the all this stuff. It looks like a Series 6, but just with a bit of a bigger screen. In fact, they're so confident in this bigger screen that they are giving you a full QWERTY keyboard on it, which kind of relies on a bit of machine learning and stuff to guess what you should be typing. I need to see that in practice. The, you know, the idea of having a full keyboard on your Apple Watch, no matter how big the screen is, like it's you know destined for trouble. There are a few interesting battery related things as well. So they've maintained the same battery life, which is this 18 hour battery life, but it charges via a USB-C charger. Obviously you still have the puck that attaches to the Apple Watch, but the actual other end of it is USB-C and they're managing to get a bit of a quicker charge because of that. And they reckon that's about a 30% faster charging. So I, I think with the Apple Watch, if you've ever owned one, you'll know that unless you keep it charged overnight, if you use the sleep tracking features, the ability to charge it pretty quickly is actually quite important. So I think I'm, I'm all for that. That's fantastic news. New colours. Uh, what else? That was it, really. Um, yeah, you can get it later this fall or autumn if you're in the UK. And yeah, they, I mean, as I say, it's the most advanced smartwatch ever, but Where's the competition? Next year is gonna be a more important and I suppose more interesting year for the Apple Watch. One of the things they didn't introduce at all with the Series 7 were any new sensors. And one of the hallmarks of the Apple Watch over the last few years have been the new sensor they've added, whether it's been the heart rate sensor, the blood oxygen thing, the ECG, etc. Now for me, at the moment, and touch wood, I won't need them, but I, I know they're there. And I know for a lot of people that has been completely life-changing. So the more sensors they can add to this thing to make it more of a health device, keep doing it, keep adding them. But we didn't really see any of that this year. I think next year, the Series 8, if that's what it's going to be called, I think that is going to be quite a significant step up in terms of the Apple Watch's capabilities. What do we have next? I'll tell you what was interesting with this event. You know, 30 minutes in, I counted it, there were three product announcements and they absolutely rattled through them really quickly, but not, not too fast. It was just an impressive kind of, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, here's all the details you need to know about it. But that did bring us onto the iPhone 13. This is the part of this announcement I am least interested in, to a degree. Now the thing that the iPhone 13 announcement kind of solidified for me was that I'm not going for the Pro. I'll cover both the Pro and the, the regular 13 in one fell swoop. I don't want to waste too much of your time on this. Now both the 13 and the 13 Pro have smaller notches. Now interestingly, they, they never refer to it as the notch at Apple. To them, it just means that there is more display area, which in turn means the notch is 20% smaller. They haven't got rid of it completely. I don't think they care enough about that really. I don't really think most iPhone users care about it. I said recently that I think the notch kind of defines the iPhone. It was a bit annoying at first. I didn't like it at all at first, but it's just a thing now. It's just what the iPhone is. So, okay, it's a bit smaller. 
great. It would be nice to just see the whole thing gone, but they obviously felt they had to reduce it a little bit just to answer a few critics. Now, both the Pro and the regular 13 have the new chip, of course. So I made some notes about this. It's the A15 Bionic. I still don't know what Bionic means, but it's got 15 billion transistors because they've managed to use a five nanometer technology to create it. Six core CPU, that's with two high performance cores and the rest are low power regular performance cores. And it's the fastest CPU in any smartphone, up to 50% quicker than the competition. It's also got a four core GPU, which is 30% faster than the competition. And a 16 core, are you still awake? Sorry, a 16 core neural engine, which again, no idea what that does. And as they said, there is nothing in the world like this chip. And that is completely accurate, I'm sure. It's so fast. It's, I mean, the things you can probably do with the A15 Bionic chip in that iPhone must be mind boggling. And okay, the day-to-day -day running of that phone and the stuff it does without you thinking about it, that's great. If it makes it a nicer device to live with and you know, a device that doesn't never slows down and very rarely crashes. I mean, when was, when was the last time your iPhone crashed? Mine never crashes. And I'm sure a big part of that is, it's obviously iOS, but it's also the chip that powers it. But it's getting a bit boring. Now, the other thing they've done is re-engineer the internals of the phone. And one of the most important results of that is the fact that the batteries in all of the models are bigger. And what that means day-to-day -day use, for example, if you go for the iPhone 13 mini, you get 1.5 hours additional battery life. For the regular 13, it's two and a half hours longer. Pro, you get one and a half hours longer. And for the Pro Max, you get two and a half hours longer, which makes it the longest lasting iPhone battery ever. As you'd imagine, they've done loads of stuff with the cameras as well. The regular iPhone 13 now gets a wide lens, which I think actually it had before, to be fair. Um, but it has a bigger sensor, uses larger apertures, which if you put all that stuff together, it results in better low light performance. Better low light performance is always a good thing for taking photos with your phone. It just means you don't have to worry about the conditions, it just sorts it out for you. But the thing they spent an awful lot of time on, and I understand why they did, was cinematic mode. And cinematic mode is for video, obviously, and it does this thing called rack focus. Now I can demonstrate this now with this camera. So if I put my hand in front of the lens, you can see that it focuses on my hand. When I remove my hand from in front of the lens, it will focus back on my eyes. Ready? Now this is on a Sony FX3. It's a very expensive camera. The racking is very smooth. You can change how fast and slow it is. And it's incredibly accurate. You know, if I move backwards and forwards, it uses eye tracking to retain focus. It's brilliant. Now they're bringing something similar to the iPhone. Not quite as advanced as this, I don't think, but impressive nonetheless. And they showed this demonstration of it in this beautifully shot video where focus kept changing from the foreground to the background and really smart stuff. And they call it cinematic mode because you see, you'll see it now, you'll start watching for it. Focus racking happens all the time in movies and in TV shows. So when someone's, if I'm talking now, if there's someone behind me, focus would be on me, I'd then turn away and it would focus on the person behind me thus blurring me out slightly. Adds depth, adds a bit of storytelling. It's it's just a one of the most common cinematic and TV show camera techniques ever. It's been used for decades and decades. So to have it on your phone is really impressive. And what's even more impressive is that it can do it completely automatically for you. So the phone is even aware that when you turn your head away, you probably don't want to be focusing on that person anymore. So it then switches focus to something else, whether it be a person or something else in the background. That's really smart. Now you can do a manual version of that. You don't have to rely on this automatic machine learning slash AR stuff to do it for you, but it does show how far computational video and photography has come. We know it's come this far. It's been getting more and more impressive every year. And this little feature, when I first saw it, I thought, another kind of Dolby Vision type thing that no one's gonna use. Having thought about it a little bit more, families will find it quite interesting to play around with. But I think the key audience for this is YouTubers who are relying on their smartphone or iPhone cameras as their main camera. And the more Apple does things like this, like the cinematic mode, the less you need to spend a fortune on gear like I have. And with the iPhone 13 Pro, I don't think this is available on the, on the regular 13, but on the 13 Pro, you can also change the bokeh. So you can change the background blur on your video as well, which you can, you've been able to do that for a little now, while now with portrait photos, but you can actually now do it with video on the 13 Pro. What else do we have? Oh yeah, 5G, uh, something about more bands. The other thing they've done is they have increased the starting storage to 128 gigabytes, which is fantastic news. And it's the same pricing as well. So 
thumbs up Apple. The screen is typical iPhone, fantastic screen stuff, as you would guess. And what is quite nice is that the regular iPhone 13 retains, I think, all of the screen technology, apart from one thing, which I'll come on to in a moment, that the Pro has. So it has the XDR display, it's very bright, has the same number of nits, I think, in terms of peak brightness, wide color, HDR, all that stuff. So you're not really getting a worse screen on the regular 13, apart from one little tweak they've made to the Pro, which is they've given it ProMotion. Again, this has been rumored for ages, and it is basically Apple's version of a high refresh rate screen. Other manufacturers have been doing this for a little while now. Apple are pretty much last to the party with this one. Uh, why it's taken them this long, I don't know possibly battery life, who knows, but these bigger batteries in these phones is quite a key indicator that now was the right time to, to put ProMotion into the iPhone. However, you can only get it on the iPhone 13 Pro, not the regular iPhone 13 or the iPhone 13 mini. And what ProMotion does, it ramps up the screen refresh rate dynamically, and it does it from anywhere from 10 hertz right up to 120 hertz. And the higher the number, basically the smoother the scrolling on the screen. And if you've used an iPad Pro before with ProMotion, you'll know that it makes quite a difference. It makes the device feel faster. It's just more visually pleasing. And when you go from a ProMotion display to a non-ProMotion display, it can be a little bit jarring. I've experienced this with the iPad Pro going to the iPad Air Four, and they do feel like different devices. The iPad Air 4 feels a little bit more sluggish, even though it technically isn't. However, I use the iPad Air 4 more, and when I get my iPad mini, that hasn't got ProMotion either, and I'm not worried about it. It's a lovely feature to have, and I think if you're spending that extra money on the iPhone 13 Pro, then it's nice to know you're getting that. It will be visibly better over your mate's iPhone 13. And they spent a lot of time, as you would guess, about the video modes and the cinematic mode, again, on the iPhone 13 Pro. They even brought in Catherine Bigelow, who is a big Hollywood director, to kind of give her opinion on it, and another guy, I can't remember his name, but a cinematographer, they were both very important impressed with how fantastic this camera was. That said, they're not going to use an iPhone. I know I know full motion pictures have been shot with iPhones, which I think is great, but there's a reason the pro video camera market and the pro stills camera market hasn't collapsed. Pros probably aren't going to use iPhones unless they absolutely have to. They're going to use proper cameras for, for what they do. So I don't really buy the fact that these are built for pros. I think they're built for people with a fair amount of disposable income and the people who want to experiment with things. And going right back to what I was saying a moment ago, YouTubers. YouTubers who want to use smartphones for their channels, which I think is a fantastic strategy or save you an awful lot of money. But what I think I think I am going to be doing. I'm not going to go with the Pro, I've said that for the last two or three weeks, no interest in that whatsoever, but I'm very tempted by that iPhone 13 mini. I was tempted by the 12 mini as well. Stories about the battery life on the 12 did put me off, but the fact these have a bigger battery, the fact you're going to get that one and a half hours, which is quite a lot over the course of a day, the fact I could have the iPhone 13 mini as my main phone and the iPad mini as my main kind of browsing device and media consumption device. That's interesting. I'd love to know what you thought about the event yesterday, as it is when you're probably watching this. I was a bit disappointed there was no update to AirPods. I was expecting the next version of AirPods. That didn't happen. I think there'll probably be a press release over the next couple of weeks. But yeah, let me know what you thought. What did you think to the Apple event yesterday? And if you've still got some time and if you want something that's not related to Apple and just a bit of a bit of fun, keep watching for a link to my recent Q&A video where I asked my audience to to ask me anything and you really did and well you can see the results if you carry on watching and click that link but in the meantime thank you so much for watching guys remember to hit the subscribe button and the little bell if you've got this far thank you so much and I will see you in the next video